right, welcome to chapter two. Uh, in this chapter, we have a few learning outcomes. We're going to display data graphically and then interpret the graphs. The three types of graphs we're going to focus on in chapter two are the stem plot, the histogram, and the box plot. We mentioned histograms a bit in the last chapter. They look like bar charts, but they have numerical data on the x-axis. And these three graphs solely deal with numerical data. After we get through some of these graphs, we are going to start to talk about measures of center. So we want to be able to recognize, describe, and calculate measures of center in terms of our data sets. All right. And the, the most common measures of center are the mean, the median, and the mode. You might have heard of these terms before. We're usually pretty familiar with mean. Maybe we've heard of median, and maybe we've heard of mode. But when I talk about a measure of center, it just means a number in the middle. Okay. So a measure of center is a number in the middle of the data set. Okay, so we can sound really fancy and say measure of center, but it's just saying, hey, where's the middle? Here's a whole bunch of data. Where's the, the middle of it? Where's the center? The next thing we want to make sure we can talk about is we want to recognize, describe, and calculate measures of spread. And again, a measure of spread, it's just a number, but we have a few versions or a few different statistics that we can talk about. So we'll define what the variance is, what the standard deviation is. I'll talk about IQR, spread, and range. And as you can start to see here, back when we were talking about center, there's mean, median, mode. There were three of them that we'll go over in this class. We'll actually pick up a fourth one later on. For measures of spread, you see variance, standard deviation, IQR, spread, and range. There are five of them. You don't have to quote all three of these each time out. And you don't have to quote all five of these each time out. Pick one. Pick the one that's appropriate. All right, so again, when you see measures of spread, I am just talking about a number. It's one number. All right, this will tell you how spread out your data is. Is it close together or is it far apart? We will also talk about measures of location. You might have heard of quartiles before. I am pretty sure most of us have heard of percentiles before. So this measure of location, it tells you things like, is my data point in the first half of the data set or the second half? Or if we're talking about the first quartile or the quartiles, is my data point in the first quartile, the second quartile, third, did I hit the fourth quartile, right? Or percentiles. I scored in the 90th percentile. I scored in the 23rd percentile. What does that mean? And then last but not least, we will talk about the shape of a graph. All right. And we will pick up all sorts of vocab terms for that as well. So in terms of the statistical graphs that you will be responsible for, by the end of this chapter, we've got three of them. You're gonna pick up stem plots. We will look at regular old stem plots, and then we will pick up back-to-back -back stem and leaf plots. And when I say back-to-back, -back, this is when we'll compare two different data sets at the same time on the same graph. So this stem and leaf plots, when you have one data set, back-to-back -back is when we have two data sets and we're comparing. For histograms, again, I've said this before, but it, it's worth repeating. They look similar to bar charts, so they're gonna have those rectangles. Uh, but on the x-axis, we have numerical data, and there's no spaces between the bars unless there was a gap in the data. But typically with bar charts, we put spaces between the different categories on your categorical variable. And in histograms with that numerical variable on the x-axis, there's no space in, uh, between those bars. The last plot we'll get to is my personal favorite. I use it all the time. It's called a box plot. We will talk about a regular box plot and it's a, a box plot that does not display outliers. This is fine, but we really wanna get over to here. This is the one I actually use the most, the modified box plot. It'll actually show us where our outliers are. So my go-to graph, um, histograms are pretty good, but my go-to is definitely the modified box plot. Make a little plot, see if there's any outliers, call it a day. When we talk about parallel box plots, again, like back-to-back -back stem and leaf plots, this is when we will be comparing two data sets at the same time. So one box plot, great. That means one data set. Parallel box plots, I've got at least two box plots and I've got at least two data sets I can compare. So what we're going to go through for the entirety of chapter two is we're going to get this vocab under our belt. And you're going to hear me frequently say, remember your socks. All right. And if you just 
look down here for a moment. When I say SOX, you see that acronym. And it's going to stand for the first letter in these four terms. So let's go over them. When I say remember your SOX, the first S we'll refer to is you owe me a sentence about the shape of the graph. So you might tell me the shape of the graph is normal, the shape of the graph is uniform, the shape of the graph is symmetric, it's skewed right, skewed left, bimodal. You will pick an appropriate vocabulary term to describe the shape of your graph. So that's one of the sentences you owe me whenever you're writing up the uh, whenever you're writing up how, you, how your graph plays out, the, the properties of your particular graph. You will owe me a sentence about outliers or other unusual features. Outliers, I will, I will go through the calculations of how to officially declare, yes, this data value is an outlier, no, this one is not. But if we just kind of zoom out, outliers are large, uh, extreme data values, whether they're really, really large or really, really small. They're just in one direction. They're, they're out of the norm. Of, of the, your data set. So the formal definition will come towards the end of this chapter. So we've got the first S stands for shape, the O stands for outliers, the C stands for center, and when we're talking about the center you'll usually give me either the mean or the median. You could give me the mode if you wanted to, and we'll even pick up something called the mid-range. But you want one of these. You don't need all of them. In terms of the last S, the measure of spread, so the last S stands for spread, there are five numbers you could quote. You don't have to quote all five, but you do have to give me a sentence about one. So you could give me the spread, the range, the interquartile range, which you heard me earlier referring to as the IQR. Okay. You could give me the standard deviation or the variance. And again, I really want to stress you don't need all five. You need to pick one. Usually, it, I pick the mean and the standard deviation. Those are common pairings I go with or I go median and range. All right, it just depends on the data. And we'll, we'll talk in this chapter about when is it appropriate to use mean and standard deviation? When do I really wanna use median and IQR or median and range? So we'll talk about when do we use these particular measures of spread and center and when do we use these other ones? But, but let's get into our first two. So the spread. If I ever uh, ask you to quote the spread, you owe me two numbers and you owe me the low and the high, so the spread is the scope of the values in your data set from smallest to largest. I.e., maybe I had some data and the spread of that data set was 10 to 23. So if you're ever quoting me the spread, you owe me two numbers. Oops, that's not how you spell O. You owe me two numbers. All right, i.e. the low and high. And, and that spread, that, that two, two numbers, if you give those to me, you, you've accomplished your sentence for, for the measure of spread. That's great. Uh, two numbers is fine. I, the range is even easier. It's one number. So I'll have to write one number down if I'm quoting the range. So the range is defined as the difference between the largest and the smallest value. So if we were looking at this data set that had a spread from 10 to 23, if I subtract these two numbers, if you take 23 and subtract 10, so go high minus low, 23 minus 10 is 13. So the range is just 13. And if you're ever quoting me the range, you owe me one number. Okay. So if I had a data set whose spread was 10 to 13, excuse me, 10 to 23, the range would be 13. You could quote me the spread, you could quote me the range, if you're feeling crazy, it's Friday night, go ahead and quote me both, but I only need one. So when it comes to writing up these, these properties from your, your, your graph, you wanna keep in mind this acronym, SOX. Now, if there's ever a cluster, like a bunch of data values grouped together or a gap, a lot of times we report those. So if I have a cluster, I might mention, hey, there's a cluster of data over here on the high end of my x-axis or there's a gap here between seven and 10. So if you have clusters or gaps, we can mention them. Okay, and that's why I write if applicable, but these four are always applicable. So I will refer to this as our socks, shape, outlier, center, and spread. And whenever you have a graph, whether it's a stem plot or a histogram or a box plot, you're gonna have to give me your socks. So I'm always gonna wanna see four sentences 
and each of the four sentences should talk about shape or outliers or center or spread. Okay, the first type of plot we're going to make together is going to be called a stem and leaf display or a stem and leaf plot or a stem plot, pick one. All right, so when do we use these? We use stem and leaf plots when we have numerical data sets with a small to moderate number of observations. The more observations you have, the more tricky the stem and leaf plot is going to become. And it's usually in between 20 and 30 data points that I, I stop writing stem and leaf plots and go over to a histogram. But it really just depends on the data and what I'm asked to do. But if I have numerical data, small to moderate number of observations, okay, I, I can make a stem and leaf plot. So let me read off how we construct those. And then I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna, I'm gonna construct one for you. So you will select one or more leading digits for the stem values. The trailing digits, or sometimes just the first one of the trailing digits, becomes the leaves. All right, we will list the possible stem values in a vertical column. We will record the leaf for every observation behind, excuse me, beside the corresponding stem value, and we will indicate the units for stems and leaves somewhere in the display. And I know that sounds like a lot, and it might not totally be clear here, but I'm going to show you how this works out. So let's go ahead. Take a moment, we'll read through example one, and as I'm reading through example one, I want you to think, what is the variable in this problem? We always want to start there, okay? So let's see here. If I look at example one, it says, the accompanying data on daily protein intake in grams of protein per kilogram of body weight for 20 competitive athletes was obtained from a plot in the article, a comparison a plasma, glutamine, concentration in athletes from different sports. Okay, here's some data, and I see the direction that says construct a stem and leaf plot. All right, so as I go through this, I want you to think, what do these data values represent? What does 1.4 represent? What does 2.2 represent? What was our variable in this problem? So if I write variable up here, okay, if I look at this, I had 20 athletes, I wasn't keeping track of their heart rate. I wasn't keeping track of their weight, their height, their sport preference. I was keeping track of their daily protein intake. So that is my variable in this problem. All right, and the units, it says it here. I mean, they're a little funky, but that's okay. Grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. So whenever you see the word per, that's talking about some kind of ratio, some kind of fraction. So it looks like I have grams in ratio to kilograms, or specifically grams of protein in ratio to kilograms of body weight. Okay. All right, so this is all fine and good. I wanna to start to construct this stem and leaf plot. And in a moment, I'm just gonna construct it, and then I'll, I'll give you a chance just to look it over, and we'll talk about how I got there, and I think it'll make more sense as I start going on with this. But before you do anything, if you have a stem and leaf plot, and we do, or we're asked to construct one, the first thing you wanna do is get this data in order. So if I look at it, it's not quite in order. I mean, 1.4 here, 2.2, 2.7, then it goes back down to 1.5. So let's get this data in order. And I, I wanna address how we would do that on our calculator. So I'm gonna get my calculator going, okay? All right, so if we remember, the first thing I wanna do is I wanna hit stat and edit, and it looks like I've got some data in lists, and that's all fine. I'm gonna go clear these out, the little one-two punch here, clear enter each time. All right, so let me go ahead and enter these data values in. Okay, now once I get those data values entered in, the first thing I do is I make sure that I have the right number of data values. If there were 20 athletes, I should have 20 data points. And if I look at my list, the first blank entry I have is in the 21st position, 
And that's a good thing, that's what I want. So I've got all of my data in there. And like I said, even though we haven't constructed this stem and leaf plot yet, you do want to get this data in order. So I'm gonna sort, all right, you have a sort function on your calculator. You can sort it ascending or descending. And it's, it's your choice what you wanna do. I'll, I'll probably sort ascending just because. All right, so if I wanna sort, let me go back to my home screen, second in mode. Let's hit our stat button. And if you look at options two and three, you have sort A and sort D. This stands for sort ascending and sort descending. And pick one. Like I said, I'm gonna pick option two. And then what you need to do is tell your calculator which lists you'd like sorted. And I would like to sort L1. So I will put in L1, I'll close that parentheses and I will hit the enter key. Once I hit enter, my calculator says, hey, it's done, I did it. So let me go back into some data entry and see what's in my list now. And you can see that data has been ordered, right? There's 1.4 and all of those numbers are in order. And I will keep that in mind, okay? I'll come back to that in just a moment. But before we move on with the stem and leaf plot, I wanna review an idea that we presented on the first page. So in a moment, I'm going to ask you, what is the spread of this data set? And what is the range of this data set? And if we remember back from the previous page, okay, the spread is the scope of the values from smallest to largest, right? and the range is the difference between the largest and smallest. So let's try and take these ideas and talk about our spread. Okay. So if I look back at my lists, I wanna find the smallest and highest values in here. So let's see what we got. It looks like my minimum was 1.4 and the highest was three. So if you scooch down to the bottom here, you can see that I've got a spot listed for this. I always wanna remind you to write up your socks. So if we take a look in the S, in the second S, it doesn't really matter what twin you do, but I typically put spread down here. You could tell me a couple things. You could just quote the spread. You could say it's 1.4 to 3.0. And then we had our units were grams per kilogram. That is the completely acceptable measure of spread. And again, you would write this up in a sentence. The spread is, and that, that, that two numbers, okay? Or you could have just told me the range. If I wanted to find the range, I would subtract these two numbers. So if I go back to my calculator for a moment, if I do three minus 1.4, I'm gonna get 1.6. So the range is 1.6 grams per kilogram. And yes, you always wanna put units. I will be looking for that. Every time we have a word problem, I need some units. And stats is all word problems. So there we go. I have out of my, my four letters I need to address, I've already addressed one of them. And again, you don't need both of these, you need one. I typically quote the range because I'm lazy and it's just one less number to write. All right, so with all of that, I'm gonna head back to the, your stem and leaf plot and I want you to watch how I construct this. Okay, so I'll put my calculator screen here so that you can see how I'm going about this. Okay, so if I, give me a moment and then watch what I'm doing and see if you can figure out why I'm ultimately doing it.
All right. So let me move my calculator off to the side here and start to map out how on earth did I go from these 20 data points to this graph. All right, so if we start to pick this apart, these bad boys over here are called the leaves. If I were to count, there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. There are 20 leaves here, meaning each leaf represents one of these data points. Okay. Now in terms of 1.4, where is that data value represented on our, our graph? Right here, stem of one, leaf of four. Where is 2.2, where is this data value represented on our graph? If you look here, we've got a stem of two and a leaf of two. So that data value, this one right here, this leaf is representing 2.2. Where is 2.7 being represented? Right here, stem two, leaf seven. Let's think about 1.5. So 1.5, you see there's three fives listed out here in my leaves, and that's because I had three values of 1.5. Where's the other one? There it is, okay? So that's how a stem and leaf is constructed. You have the freedom to pick whatever stems you want. I picked one, two, and three because my spread was 1.4 to 3.0. And the ones place seemed like a reasonable stem value. You can pick ones, you can pick, these could have been tens each, this could have meant, represented 10, 20, 30, 100, 200, 300. It really just depends on how small or large your data values are. All right, now, going off of this, this is most of the graph, but I would still dock this if we were on a midterm. So there's a couple of things that we need to add to it. First of all, I need to know what units these are. All right, I need to know, did this represent the number three? Was this 30? Is this 300? Is this 3000? It's not clear yet. So what you do is you make a little key. I usually put in a little bubble here, okay? Pick any stem and any leaf. It doesn't matter which one you pick. Um, for today, why don't I pick two and three? So off to the side here, you will tell me if you had a stem of two and a leaf of three, so I'm representing one of those leaves, the two and the threes, or stem two, leaf three, that would represent the number 2.3. So I know this doesn't represent 23, this doesn't represent 230, this isn't 23,000, it's the number 2.3, and the units on it are grams per kilogram. So that's one of the things. And I put that down here, indicate the units for the stems and the leaves somewhere in the display. Okay, that's that last bullet point. I think I just pointed to it and you can't see it. So the last thing I want, again, indicate the units for the stems and the leaves somewhere in the display. All right, the other thing that we want, we always want a title here. What are we talking about? So we, our variable in this problem was daily protein intake. So I want that written somewhere, daily protein intake. If you want to be fancy, you can say for athletes. But I need some acknowledgement of what the variable is. Okay. I always think a good rule of thumb is if somebody came into the classroom or into your office and they didn't read any of the word problem, if they just saw the graph, can they discern what that data was about. So if I look at it, I would hope somebody would say, well, I am talking about daily protein. Maybe you're not sure what grams and kilograms are, grams of uh, protein per kilogram of body weight. I could see there being some confusion there, but you should still be able to go, okay, 1.5 means 1.5 grams per kilogram of this daily protein intake. Okay, so we got our first look. This is just a regular old stem and leaf plot. All right, we got our stems that we chose, our leaves. Each leaf represents one data value over here. We made a key and we titled it, okay? So I'm gonna make a different stem and leaf plot. All right, I'm gonna construct a new one and just watch me do this one, okay? And then see if you can figure out what I'm doing here.
Okay, so we've got yet another version of this stem and leaf plot. And let's see, what did I do a little bit differently here? I still have my title. Again, I could have written the phrase for athletes, that's fine. I've got my key. I didn't choose 2.3 this time. I thought I'd go different and we went 1.4. Make that decimal a little bit um, more pronounced. Uh, I've still got my stems and my leaves, but you can start to see this L and H here. So this is just a technique we use in stats sometimes. We split things up low to high. So this is one low, one high, two low, two high, three low. And when you talk about the lows, okay, that means your leaves are somewhere between zero and four. Okay. So any leaf value that was between zero and four, I'm putting the low column or the low row. I only have the one low leaf in this, this stem of one. So that's why the four went in the one low and the rest of them went in the one high. Mm -hmm. For the twos, I had a bunch of lows. Zero, two, three, three, three was low, okay? And that's why you see it there. And three, zero is, it's low. Now for the high, that means you have leaves somewhere between five and nine. This graph is no more right nor wrong than this one. It's just another option that I wanted you to see. Uh, sometimes I go low high if my data is too jammed up. It just really depends. But this is a f absolutely fine stem and leaf plot. This is an absolutely fine low high stem and leaf plot. We even have a third one here. So let's move the page all the way up and see if we can figure out what's going on with this stem and leaf plot. Okay, so this one's also completely legitimate. It's just very different than the original and then even more different than the low high. So you could go nuts and graph something like this. And then I'm gonna ask you what's missing from this plot. So if you were a teacher, why would you dock this one? So let's try and take a look at what's going on here. I got three stems of one, 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 and then I have two, 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 and then a three. So the first thing I notice is that in this particular problem, the stems are going in descending order where previously I'd gone ascending. It's your call. Both of those are fine. And if I look here, it looks like each stem has at most two leaves. So what I mean by that is this stem had leaves four and five. This stem of one had leaves six and seven. This stem had leaves eight and nine. This stem had leaves zero and one. The reason you don't see any ones here is because I didn't have any 2.1 values in my data set. So I can see that each row has exactly two leaves corresponding to it. Which again is a totally fine way to write it up. Um, I want us to take note that there's a gap here, okay? When we split the leaves up this way, all of a sudden I actually see a gap and that gap hadn't really presented itself in the other graphs. Why is there a gap here? Well, let's count. This would have been zero ones, two threes. This would have been leaves four and five. And the reason that there's a gap here is because I had no leaves between four and five, right? There was no 2.4, there was no 2.5. I snuck back in with 2.7. There was a gap between the data values of 2.3 and 2.7. And there's a common mistake where when there's a gap like this, students will just leave this stem off. Don't leave that stem off. If there's a gap there, it should show up in your data. All right, so this is just a different version of a stem and leaf plot. So again, each stem has two corresponding leaves, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero, one. And whenever you're making a stem and leaf plot, you always need to go low to high or high to low. I don't need to write zeros down here or fours up here. I'm just gonna go low to high. When we get enough information about all of the shape, outliers, and centers, we'll come back and fill this in. So I will circle back to these examples and fill in the rest of our socks. But as of right now, as of example two, we can't fill anything beyond this, this last S here.